Good evening, everyone. We are uh, going to have a great talk here this evening, and thank you for coming. This is our inaugural young alumni speaker, uh, Sian Chowdhury, and I'm going to give you a little bit of his background, but he's going to talk some more about it during his talk. So, he is, Sian is currently a senior software engineer at Uber, and uh, he's helped develop Uber's external API, and he's helped lead integration efforts with partners such as Microsoft, Google, Visa, and Baidu. He's also been instrumental in developing the donations platform that enables riders to donate towards a cause after taking a ride. He's currently developing the Uber reward system that will enable users to take advantage of sponsored rides from partner merchants. Sian graduated from here, UTA, with a bachelor in science degree in computer science engineering, and he'll tell you what year. <laughs> and he spent five years then at Adept Technology working on industrial automation and robotics applications. Then while he was developing his software applications for robots, he was also working on a master's degree, and he has a master's in software engineering from Carnegie Mellon University as well. And while he was a grad student at CMU, he co-founded a home automation startup called Polar Meter. And he's worked at least one other place and done a number of other things. So let's welcome Sian Chowdhury. Thank you for that introduction. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Tiernan. Um, it's great to be back here, and uh, you know, just talking to Dr. Tiernan about how this room used to be where we held our engineering council meetings too. Uh, so it's good to be on this side and just kind of speaking to you guys. Um, exciting opportunity. So today, uh, the main focus of my talk is going to be about building moving experiences with the with Uber's developer platform. Uh, but as a as an UT alumnus, I felt like, uh, or I felt obligated to kind of share my journey to building these uh, uh, moving experiences, what led up to these uh, that, that experience. So I just wanted to kind of take you through that journey as well. And perhaps, like, I, I know all of us are going to tread our own paths, but hopefully uh, there's some insights that you can take from my journey and, and, and hopefully it can help you get along, get through some of the bumps along the way for you. So a few years ago, um, I remember watching um, the Stanford commencement speech that Steve Jobs gave, and it was uh, definitely one of the more inspired, most inspiring speeches that I've heard in the past. And um, one of the quotes that stood out for me was, you can't connect the dots looking back forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. You will have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. Uh, this was in the context of you know, just dealing with adversity and, and following your passion, following your heart, and moving forward. Uh, so I thought this uh, would be a good opportunity for me to look back and connect my thoughts. So this is where it all started for me. Uh, those of you who don't, don't recognize this uh, skyline, actually I didn't either when I, when I, took the, when I got this picture. Uh, this is uh, the city that I grew up in. Uh, it's Mumbai, it's the financial capital of India. And um, it's it's been it's been a while since I've been back, but like just looking at this picture bring back, brings back a lot of good memories. Uh, the first thing I wanted to kind of talk to you guys, guys about is you know how I actually ended up at UTA. Uh, so I was uh, sitting around the dinner table with my my parents, and I, I kind of looked at them and I said, you know, I, I, I think I want to go to the U.S. to study uh, engineering. And my mom kind of gave me this awkward look, and then my dad like looked up and he, he you know he's like. Uh, he had, this, he had this space where he wanted to uh, you know, break it to me that we didn't have that kind of money to send you to school in the US. So like, how, how are you going to do this? And before they could do that, I kind of talked to them about, you know, look, you know, there's a scholarship, there's, you know, I, can, I can work and, and kind of pay the bills. I can, um, and the program itself is amazing. So uh, I just wanted to take that opportunity and like, make the most of it. So they were reluctant at first, but eventually they agreed. and. Uh, they, you know, as any supportive parents would do, they supported me in my best to come here. Uh, at that time, my friend uh, Nadine was also uh, at UTA, so he, you know, I, that kind of helped me a little bit because I, I, I knew that I had somebody to rely on when I came here. So, um, in terms of uh, just getting to Dallas, that was like the first step. So, like, I took, you know, took my SATs and then. Um, 
you know, applied, got in, and then finally, you know, the next thing I know, I want to fly to Dallas and, uh, you know, to, to an unknown world where the only person I knew was my buddy you know, Nadine. So that's me connecting the first set of dots, and that's a picture of him. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't think that's the best picture of him. He's probably going to hate me for this. But. <laughs> um, so life at UTA was uh, really interesting. Um, the first thing I would call out is that we had world-class faculty and the instructors and professors that we, uh, that we have here, I mean, they were true mentors, they truly inspired me, and every day I strive to be better because of them. And that has been one of the major uh, success factors for me, so I definitely want to call that out. Um, you, know, you know, people get caught up in GPA a lot, so I have to outline here about picking the toughest classes because uh, I think you don't want to maximize for GPA, you want to maximize for learnings. So that's a better return on your investment. Uh, so think about that next time you go into a class. Um, also in terms of like other opportunities, like I wanted to make the most out of my college experience, so I tried to get involved as much as possible. Uh, so engineering stock student council was a good way to do that. Uh, the picture on the right hand side is uh, from 2008, I believe, and that's the engineering student council crew. We were called uh, JCEO back then. And that's me on the far right, and it's a really good looking gang right there. I, <laughs> um, I was also part of ACM, uh, went, to, went to programming contest uh, through ACM, that was a good experience as well. Uh, and finally, like, uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Honors College, but I don't know if it's still around. Is it? It is. It is? Okay. okay, okay, so I, uh, uh, I went to this research program for the Honors College, and then that taught me a lot about like just algorithms and data structures and actually like figuring out how research is done. So just going through that whole process was interesting as an undergrad. Uh, and finally, I have uh, tubing at the math clinic up here. Uh, that's how I paid the bills. Uh, so it's, it was important to me. And it also taught me a lot about interacting with people and just figuring out you know, uh, how, to, how to connect with people and just being, you know, do impart some knowledge or, you know, just you, you know something and you want to explain it to somebody and that, that takes skill and that helped uh, mathematically help me form these skills. So senior design uh, rolls around, so that's my final year of uh, college and I was mentored by Dr. Brian Huff um, and I definitely, again, going back to the concept of like mentors at UTA, uh, it, I just saw him being really passionate about what he's doing. He was not just a professor. He wasn't just about um, just doing his research. It was, you know, he was geeking out with us. He was in there, in the lab, late at night with us, just working on stuff. And that was, to me, um, again, that's something that helped me build my work ethic and just uh, understanding that, you know, if you're passionate about something, you can go after uh, whatever you want to do. Um, so the goal, goal of uh, my senior design was to actually get to um, this IGBC competition in, um, in Rochester, Michigan. Uh, it stands for Intelligent Ground Vehicles Competition. Essentially, we had to do two things. Um, one is navigate to uh, a bunch of GPS coordinates while uh, we're detecting and avoiding uh, obstacles. And as part of this project, like this is the first time I was exposed to um, you know, just building hardware. I mean, I'd, I'd taken digital logic, I'd taken some um, hardware classes, but you know, just being interacting with sensors and encoders, that was truly an amazing experience. And um, I mean, even from the software perspective, uh, just uh, dealing with multi-threading and just having the ability to build fault-tolerant systems and uh, processing data in real time, that's something that uh, I thought was a very good learning experience and just putting uh, you know, things that you learn in your textbooks to good use. Um, so that, that experience in itself, like I thought, uh, just having the ability to write code and affect something in the physical world uh, was a surreal experience for me and, and, and I definitely, definitely cherish that. So graduation rolls around, um, you know, as a bright-eyed optimist, I was looking forward to my professional career um, and, you know, just if, I love this picture, I mean, I got it as a stock image, but like everyone's really happy and that's exactly, that definitely captures the emotions that, uh, that we had at that particular point in time. But here's the reality. This is 2008, and um, you know we're we're in in the middle of a global uh, recession and a huge financial crisis, and there weren't a lot of jobs out there. And um, I just remember thinking to myself, like, you know, it, you know, it'll work out. I know it always does. So I just have to keep, um, and I just have to have faith. And 
in comes on campus UTA recruiting or uh, on campus uh, uh, recruiting to the rescue. Uh, they they brought in a company called Adept Technology. They were actually going, making their rounds all over the country, uh, trying to recruit students from uh, different colleges. And uh, they happened to come to UTA. Um, you know, those of, those of you who don't check each and every email, this is this is why you do it, especially <laughs> around the time when you're looking for jobs. And I just happened to stumble upon that email. Um, I I talked to Dr. Huff, who was also like uh, had some ties with the company. And I uh, remember just walking into his lab and kind of playing around with some of the adept robots, which helped me a lot in preparing for the interview. So I had um, an opportunity to kind of, uh, I guess, you know, gain an edge in some sense by uh, being exposed to the robots themselves. Um, so I had one interview out here uh, on campus uh, with this gentleman named Kyle Nelson. And I get that uh, gentleman is important because I'll, uh, three years down the line, he becomes my manager and another mentor who. Uh, has a significant impact on my life. Um, but here's the way uh, the dots connected again, like Dr. Brian Huff, who's one mentor, and, and then I ended up meeting Kyle, who was uh, another mentor in my life. Uh, this is going from UTA to, uh, to Adept. Uh, so finally, I uh, ended up going to California, doing a set of on-sites uh, with Adept Technology, and I got the job. Exciting opportunity. I was like, they're paying you to play with robots. This is amazing. Uh, when do I start, right? And um, and once I started in depth, uh, it was just just walking through the hallways with all these giant robots mounted on the side and moving at a really high uh, high pace and, and just picking up parts from like conveyor belts and like it, it just it it was just fascinating. But somebody who loves engineering, this was just a mix of software engineering, um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, just all coming together. And, uh, and, and it was, it was just definitely something that uh, I enjoyed. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about the company itself, it's a global company. It's about uh, 150 employees worldwide. Um, they were public at the time. Now they've been bought over by another company called Omron out of Japan. Uh, but essentially, I started off as an applications engineer. Uh, what that meant was I basically went into uh, factories and made applications work with uh, robots. So that could it, that also involved like installing robots and kind of setting up the application the way the, the customer wanted it to. Um, and uh, you wore wore multiple different hats. Um, you know, you, you work with the sales guys uh, to kind of figure out the technical sales portion of things. Uh, you uh, you know kind of started wiring up things if you needed to. Uh, I'm really bad at that, but I did it anyway. <laughs> Some of those robots probably don't work, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm long gone, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it's just it's just a fun experience. So I did that for a couple of years, and you know, it, it also felt like the company had been around for 25 years, but it had the startup puzzle. I I just uh, got an opportunity to learn a lot from uh, my peers. They were, um, you know, again, like everyone was really passionate and just like these uber geeks who just wanted to build something cool and like and and. And just being around that that vibe and that energy uh, really motivated me and um, had me, uh, you know, got uh, made me build a lot of like, interesting things. Uh, I also got an opportunity to travel a lot because of that job. So I went to factories in um, in Denmark, in China, in India, all over the U.S. and uh, just seeing how stuff is made uh, is interesting. It also uh, kind of uh, gives you this feeling of like knowing too much and then you don't want to use certain things, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it was totally worth it, it's just being able to see that. I, I do have a video, I mean, usually people like to show things, um, you know, when things work perfectly, but uh, I like the process rather than the result, and this kind of summarizes my, uh, most of my integrations. Uh, let me just give it, okay, give it a couple more minutes. Oh. So, essentially, like I'd, I'd go into these customer sites, and in, in this case, uh, uh, you have a conveyor belt, you have a sensor that's not mounted uh, prior to, uh, upstream to the robot, and it latches the position of the milk pouches, and the robot goes through and picks up the milk pouch and like puts it uh, in the in the box. Simple application, uh, but you go in there. There's all of these little nuances that you forget. So like. I'm, I'm, you know, like I get through a day and I'm like, oh, I got this. This is going to be good. Just give it a couple of minutes and I'm going to walk out of here. And then right as you're trying to walk out of there, it's like stuff will start falling apart. But uh, that was fun. It's just, uh, it's one of those things where when it actually did work, it was a, a really good feeling. 
Uh, so those of you who are interested in robotics or interested in sort of uh, just even working with hardware, I highly recommend just kind of exploring beyond just you know your standard you know the, the Facebooks, Googles, or the Ubers of the world. Just uh, kind of explore these options as well. Uh, so so uh, two years in, in, into my uh, position at Adept, I was application engineering was fun, but at, at some point. I realized that I needed to gain expertise in one thing, so I was doing electrical, mechanical, and software engineering, and it was kind of like picking my major all over again, and, and, and I decided to go with software engineering, kind of coming back to my roots. Um, and at that point, uh, Kyle Nelson, who was, uh, who was uh, uh, the gentleman who had initially recruited me, uh, he was uh, building the application layer on, on top of these robots, and he said, you know, why don't you come work with me, and um, I just, latched on to that, uh, or, or I, I just uh, took that opportunity and like, you know, latched on to him as, uh, and, and learned as much as I possibly could from that experience. Um, that's actually the first time that I learned how to write professional code. And it's a whole lot different from what, we, what you do in college or when you kind of like just make things work. Um, it's, it's, it, it was just, just like little things like even aesthetics of code, like that's something that you don't think about. But um, I would basically go through um, just pages, of, uh, sorry, uh, just just lines and lines of code that he had written, and like just the patterns that he used, and uh, you know, it, it started to make sense to me. I was like, it's, this is not just um, you know book knowledge. This is something that's actually used in the industry, and it's used well. Um, so again, like I can't stress the importance of having good mentors in your life, and especially early on in your career, they set you on a right path to success. Um, I've been able to take some of the values that I learned from him and bring it to Uber, and it's definitely uh, kept the quality bar pretty high at uh, in my team. Um, so I, I realized that you know if I wanted to focus on software engineering, uh, you know there were. You know, it was in a city called Pleasanton, which was across the bay from San Francisco, and I'm seeing all this innovation happen in San Francisco, and I wanted to be part of that. Um, so right uh, when I was, uh, was actually working for Kyle, um, I also met this gentleman named Ed Katz, who had come in for, uh, uh, he was a robotics enthusiast, but he also happened to be a professor at CMU, uh, and uh, he, he looked at one of my demos for, you know, involved a haptic device controlling a robot, and he was like, you know, have you considered going back to grad school? And I was like, you know, I think that would be an interesting move for me, so I ended up checking out an info session about CMU, um, and uh, they, they preached this philosophy of learn by doing, um, and, and I was definitely hooked at that point. So this is very project-based, very relevant to um, the software, uh, very relevant to software engineering. So I ended up going to that info session, and then uh, applying, going through an interview process, taking GMAT, uh, just going through the whole uh, application process, and eventually ended up at CMU. Uh, and that's Dr. Ed Katz, uh, who uh, ended up playing, again, uh, multiple roles uh, in my uh, career as well, so I'll talk about that. So life at uh, CMU, um, I think the two main highlights for me um, were uh, the learn by doing philosophy, where we just did uh, basically every course that I took had a project, and um, we used to present every week. And we also had uh, uh, just uh, just this ability of like collaborating with teams. So it gave me an opportunity to collaborate with folks in different industries. So uh, in San Francisco and Seattle, uh, people from companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook. And for somebody who's coming from a dev, I hadn't really seen that world. So just being able to talk to them and just uh, getting that experience was was great. And just them bringing their perspective and me bringing, bringing my perspective to robotics. Um, and, and when we jammed on projects, it was really uh, it was, it was a remarkable experience for me. Um, I also got exposed to Ruby on Rails. And um, if you guys don't know about the, the phenomenon, that, phenomenon that Ruby on Rails caused in Silicon Valley, it essentially transformed the way startups uh, Operate because uh, it provided a uh, a framework, a common convention uh, for everyone to build apps, and uh, it definitely revolutionized things. Uh, so I I, I, I kind of got hooked on that sense too. I started working on building my own apps and just not knowing anything about HTML, CSS, or uh, any of the backend or uh, any anything about how web works. It just uh, it gave me an opportunity to get uh, build my own stuff and, and from scratch. <laughs> Um, the other thing I was able to do is uh, this 
startup called Polar Meter. So it came out of an engineering elective that I took one summer. And it was uh, with another friend of mine who was also going to grad school. Uh, initially, it just started off for something that we wanted to do for, uh, for the class. Uh, but we were so into it. We, uh, we actually like had a prototype, we went and talked to customers, we actually wanted to make a business out of it. This was something that we felt strongly about and we were like, oh, you know, it has a mix of hardware, it has a mix of software. So it's just like, just putting those two worlds together and um, I think both of us were intrigued and we wanted to get going, uh, keep going. Um, unfortunately, uh, like building a hardware company is really difficult. It's just, uh, it's just uh, you know, you, you might be interested in it, but it's just, the, the reality of it, it takes a lot of work. Um, but that being said, I stayed in grad school, but my co-founder actually left grad school to start on with another company, and, uh, and, and he's doing really well. So uh, it did work out for one of us. <laughs> um, and that's a, that's a picture from our, our graduation ceremony. Um, all right, so, um, you know, I was looking, I was, I was at a depth for almost five years at this point when I was graduating from um, uh, CMU and I just wanted to look at other opportunities. I mean, I looked at other robotics companies, but uh, I, you know, I, like I said, you know, I, I looked. I was kind of drawn to all these like bigger companies, like the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. And I was just like, I want to be part of this. Uh, but here's the reality: interviewing is hard, right? And with somebody who didn't come from that background, um, you know, it essentially be a coding round, an architecture round, and a problem solving round. I do find in coding and um, problem solving, and I knew nothing about architecture because I'd never built systems like that. Um, but it just, you know, you just keep practicing, you keep, you know, you go to the right blogs, you read about it, and eventually you get it. So, um, the lesson here is that, you know, I, I wanted to kind of put up my failures here because, you know, nothing, like it seems like, you know, I shouldn't be a software engineer based on this record, but, um, uh, but I, here's what I did. I basically, a year later, I, I went back and did another loop of these uh, companies. And the first company uh, uh, I got in touch with was Expedia uh, because they had reached out to uh, CMU. And, um, and I was like, hey guys, you know, I, I interviewed uh, um, you know, six months ago and I haven't, um, you, you know, I don't think things quite went uh, well, but um, I've gotten better since then and here's all the projects that I've worked on. And um, sure enough, like they, you know, Ed Katz actually got me in touch with somebody on their team. Um, and it was uh, this gentleman named uh, Mike McClay. Again, he would become my manager at Expedia. And, uh, you know, this time I actually went through the rounds and made it, you know, just, it, it, it took a while, but it was, it was really worth it. So finally, I was in San Francisco, so that was the good news, right? So like I was uh, in Pleasanton looking at, at the Bay Bridge, but now I'm actually on it, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, what was it like at Expedia? So uh, I was, I mean, I was building apps on the site, but I didn't know what it meant to actually build applications at scale. And this was my opportunity to kind of like just soak everything in, so like learn about uh, mobile development, web app development, uh, just building up infrastructure for uh, web apps to just, it was, it was an interesting experience. Also like working with product managers and designers, as a, when you work for a robotics company, like you as an engineer, you do all the design and you do um, uh, the product management work. So, uh, so this was like an alien feeling to me and, and, and but it was, it was really good to like collaborate and like jam on projects with these designers and product, product managers. I also learned a lot about A-B testing. So e-commerce is all about small tweaks, right? I mean, it's that purchase flow that you care about and you want to maximize the purchase flow. Um, so uh, we, I understood how like small tweaks can have like a significant impact on the business at that scale. Um, I also learned about developing um, uh, iOS applications. That's something that I had messed with and um, just the nuances of Objective-C and that was, uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, so a few few months, yeah, jump the gun there. But and anyway, so the, a, f a few months in, um, Mike had already moved on to Uber, and um, we had this little fantasy football uh, uh, group that we had, and we would meet up once a year because uh, we were all like spread spread out at that point, and you know, uh, sitting and chatting, and he, he said he was talking to me about all the things that they were doing at Uber, and it was still a startup at that point. So to me, and I like. The perception in the media was that it's all that's embroiled in all these like regulatory issues, and 
I, I didn't know if this was something that I wanted to get into, but um, I went and I checked it out, and I was like, you know, let's just go talk to some of the engineering engineers and see what they're all about. And uh, it was a, a really eye-opening experience to me because they were scaling so fast, and the, the problems that they were facing were really interesting. And um, the biggest thing for me was like they were not afraid to take risks because uh, they were at a point where um, you know they had to scale or the company would die. So uh, they were just trying out stuff, and I wanted to be part of that. Uh, so again, this this interview process was, was probably like the toughest that I've had so far, where um, essentially, you not only had like a set of like a round of interviews, but we also had to do a coding challenge where you build an app from scratch and review your code and try to um, and 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 give you feedback based on that. Um, but essentially, it worked out and I ended up at Uber. So that's how I got to actually building these business experiences, and now onto Uber and how um, and the developer platform. Before we go down that path, I just wanted to kind of summarize me connecting all the dots and the, in my case, like I said, um, it was the people in my life that, that actually helped me connect these dots. It wasn't apparent to me. Um, but yeah, um, on to Uber. So I have a short video. Uh, to, if you guys don't know what Uber is, uh, this might be uh, a good primer. Consider the bit, the building block of the digital world. It was invented just 70 years ago, yet in its short life, it has changed the way we communicate, do business, and live almost every aspect of our lives. For Uber, the bit represents our technology. It's complex, precise, and advanced. But when it's expressed, it is effortless and refined. And if you think the bit is a big deal, consider the atom. Born 13.8 billion years ago, the atom is responsible for everything, from the BLT, to moms everywhere, to New York City. And for us, the atom signifies our rapidly improving cities, the goods we move from place to place, and most importantly, the people we serve. Until a few short years ago, atoms and bits existed in entirely different worlds. But then, something happened. At Uber, we asked, what if we brought these two worlds together? What would that look like? It looks like this. We are able to create safe, low-cost transportation options, like Uber Pool and Uber X. We are able to create efficient and more reliable ways of getting people the things they need. We are able to deliver fresh cooked meals from the most popular, iconic restaurants within minutes. And someday, safe, efficient movement of people and things at a giant scale. Most of us don't think about bits or atoms much, if ever. We think about how to get from here to there, the people in our lives, the millions of tiny dramas that play out across the world each day, the human stuff. Uber ultimately succeeds because we think about the human stuff first. But the way we do it, that's our secret. We leave no bit or atom unturned to create industries that serve people. And not the other way around. Essentially, our mission, mission statement is transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. And uh, it's, it's that getting that magical feeling of just you know, pressing a button and a ride comes to you and you get in, get to your destination, don't have to worry about a wallet and you walk out. Um, that's what we want to take to all the other verticals that we have going on right now, like Uber Rush and Uber Eats as well. So these are the current stats. Um, so we are in 60, 60, over 60 countries, uh, over 350 uh, cities, million, uh, over a million driver partners, uh, and millions of riders. Uh, so what we wanted to get to was, uh, you know, we, we knew that Uber's going to be fast, and we were coming up with all these ideas, but we wanted to put the power in the hands of developers. Uh, so just having 
So we wanted to figure out a way to give Uber's functionality or Uber's platform uh, to these developers, to these partners, and have and be more integrated in the web. Uh, so that's when we decided to build out the Uber developer platform. And essentially, uh, we started by exposing a set of APIs. And those of you who don't, are not familiar with APIs, it's the way apps communicate with each other, or either fetching information or sending information to each other. Um, so in terms of uh, just dissecting the word, uh, build in this case is just, you know, we, we, culturally we have this let builders build approach, and we wanted to kind of uh, keep that in mind while we're building out the platform. And uh, in terms of moving experiences, it's not just about moving people from point A to point B, but also maintaining the magic of Uber, which is just, uh, you, know, you want to get that feeling of like, not have to think about anything, but just uh, whatever you're uh, requesting is, is there for you. So in 2014, we first released the Uber API. We launched with about eight partners. Um, I believe it might have been actually 10, but uh, I think we have a few of them listed up here. And, um, and today we actually partner with, uh, I don't know, a lost count, but you can see like a lot of big names are also up here, like Facebook, Apple, uh, Google, uh, and Baidu in China. They're a little hard to see on that. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, trust me, they're on there. <laughs> um, so going back to connecting the dots here, so, so we wanted to uh, kind of think, think about it in terms of the different segments of the Uber ride. Uh, so either you, know, you could want a ride now experience, you could um, also want a ride later experience. Say for example, if you wanted to uh, schedule a ride for the airport for tomorrow, uh, in that case, it might be a ride later experience. And then there might be some data that you need uh, post ride, so just right after you've gotten out of the car, or maybe you've taken a set of trips and you want, wanted some data for, for those trips. Um, so that's sort of like the, the baseline of thinking about the problem. And then we ended up with uh, these set of endpoints. So essentially the first set talks about the product's endpoint, which you know, tells you whether you have Uber X, Uber Excel, Uber Pool, um, what's around in your area, uh, price estimates and time estimates. So like how much is it going to cost you to get from point A to point B, and uh, how much time is it going to take for your Uber to arrive at your doorstep. Uh, the right request endpoint is something that we released after the fact. Um, we wanted to not only give you the ability to deep link into the Uber app, but also build the whole Uber experience into your app. Uh, this was primarily useful for, uh, say, markets like China, where you know people uh, weren't downloading the Uber app as much. So uh, we, we partnered up with Baidu Maps, uh, uh, one of the leading map providers in that country, and they built the whole Uber experience on top of the Uber developer platform um, in uh, Baidu Maps itself. We also uh, exposed the, the reminders endpoint, which essentially is an extension of like scheduling your ride uh, for later. Uh, the, the last section here, um, it's, it's, it's pretty new. We, we're still, we've exposed these endpoints, but there's not a lot of like, uh, partners that are using it yet. But essentially, you could get more information about the trip. You can also uh, get history about um, all the trips that you've taken. Uh, so I'll show you a couple of integrations of that, uh, of that nature. So this is your standard integration. So this is uh, with CityMapper. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, that's data that's coming from the products endpoint. Um, that's from price estimates, and then uh, the ETAs are coming from the time estimates endpoint. Uh, and of course, the deep linking aspect of things, you know, if you're in your app and you want to bump over to the Uber app, then you just provide a deep link to, to do that. Uh, this is also, this kind of goes through the ride reminder integration where if you set up an appointment, then you can go through the same flow where the ride actually comes to you at the time of your appointment as opposed to requesting the ride at that particular point in time. Uh, we also did something with, uh, with Pebble and we're trying to do more stuff with uh, um, just Android Wear and like other companies that are out there um, and just building out the whole request ride integration within Pebble itself. Uh, this one I'm going to skip. This is again going through uh, the right reminders endpoint. But uh, uh, finally, like this is the, one of the applications for the history or the me endpoint, where 
Uh, you can kind of see like how many rides you've taken and all the miles that you've ridden. Uh, it's interesting to look at, but there's not a whole lot of value in terms of uh, uh, you know what, what the customer can do with this. But uh, we do like this uh, leaderboard in terms of like who's taking the most amount of rides, right? Uh, this is again just uh, I'm going to skip the slide. Essentially, these are the verticals that um, we are in right now, and all the partners and how we categorize them. And this is one of the cooler integrations that we did with Facebook, where you can request a ride within Messenger itself. And that's another feature where uh, you get more information about the trip itself. And that was the trip experiences endpoint. Uh, HipChat did something similar as well, so I'm going to skip that slide. And then um, onto Hilton, which uh, is pretty, pretty standard for hotel apps to kind of have this ability to deep link into Uber. So just providing like an Uber widget within their app. So that's something that we're trying to push for as well. Uh, same goes for United. And yeah, so I want to just uh, talking about life at Uber. Uh, so the first thing I want to address is you know the perception of the company. You know, Uber's been in the news for uh, you know sometimes not for, for, for the best reasons, but uh, but we're, we're maturing as a company. Um, we're definitely accountable for a lot of uh, if, if things go wrong, we try to fix it. We we, we don't shy away from responsibility. Uh, but we definitely be cognizant of the fact that anything that we do is kind of put out of the Microsoft microscope, so we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing. Um, I also understood the power of city teams, so Uber has a very decentralized uh, uh, sort of like power structure in terms of city teams where we have boots on the ground and the city teams are responsible for the success of the city. And uh, that concept to me has been pretty fascinating because all the cities end up competing with each other to get better. And um, that kind of means more rights and more business for us. Uh, the scaling challenges that uh, we've faced in the past couple of years have been really interesting as well. Uh, because we went into India and China and the markets are really big, but they also have their own set of problems that we have to deal with. Um, and especially, for example, like if, when we uh, went into China, it was a matter of like we can't like put all our um, US users data in the Chinese data centers. So just in terms of security, there were a lot of challenges that we had to work around. Um, in India, for example, like maps don't work just right. So, um, so what, you know, how do we get around those particular problems? Um, so scaling has definitely been sort of the focus for us for the past uh, couple of years now. The one thing that I, I, I did notice when I joined the company was it was just it was really fast paced and we were working on high impact products. Uh, so the development cycle tends to be really short. Um, so from inception to launch, um, a, a lot of these partnerships would take maybe a month would be the longest we would go in trying to launch something. So there's no like extended six month to a year project unless you're building a platform. Uh, we also have new initiatives now, so Uber Eats, Rush, ATC. Um, so Eats has been on demand meals, Uber Rush on uh, demand delivery, and ATC. Uh, this is where we're experimenting with uh, uh, just autonomous vehicles and mapping and safety. So I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about just working for a startup versus a big company. Um, so the only big company that I worked for was Expedia. Uh, Adept had been around for a while, but it was still small. So uh, I kind of can give you both perspectives. Uh, so for a startup, there's definitely high risk, high reward uh, situation. Um, but keep in mind that not all startups work out. So uh, you're going into it, you're putting in long hours. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, product ownership. You're exposed to different facets of the business. Um, you, you have the ability to take, uh, innovate and take technical risks. Uh, that's something that you can't really do at a bigger company. Um, but, but at the same time, I mean, it's low, low risk, but it's stable, right? And then you, you definitely have more traditional career growth opportunities. Um, and you, you, have your, you don't have to be exposed to different facets of the business, but you could if you wanted to. But you have your isolated set of responsibilities that you just go after. Um, but then the other thing that's good about bigger companies is 
you know, you have more mentorship opportunities because people have been around for longer, so you can kind of move around within the company and kind of uh, learn from them. So, uh, and then the, the only other thing that's, uh, I guess, it, this, I don't think it's just a negative thing, but uh, you know, bigger companies have to be careful when they face technology bets. Uh, so that's something you have to be cognizant of. Um, so there's no right answer here. It's just you have to figure out what's, what works for you, what, what you're interested in. Uh, but these are sort of my observations as well when I was uh, working at a startup and then I'm at a bigger company. Um, so my final thoughts here, I just wanted to kind of do a retrospective. It's things that I wish I would told myself like 10 years ago or eight years ago while, while I was getting into the industry. Um, and the first thing is like don't fear uncertainty, just embrace it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we like to get com comfortable, we like to get complacent, and we don't like change. And uh, you know, if you don't like change, you're not going to move up in your career. Uh, so you know, make sure you embrace that uncertainty. And just uh, sometimes it's not exactly what you planned, uh, but you know, it works out for the best. So this one, um, I think, is. is is something that I truly believe in is making friends not connections. Um, connections in this term, uh, like in this context, is you know just somebody you just get in touch with people because you know you want something for them or you need something for them. Help people unconditionally. Just um, you know be good to them, be kind, um, and don't think about just getting something in return. And this is something that you know that definitely uh, help you succeed because you know people realize that people want you, but people see like uh, what kind of person you are and. You know, if you're generally out there to help people, like uh, they'll help you back. And uh, I like this one because uh, I feel like, you know, there are times where I failed and I kind of like got off track and I, I, I didn't, and, you know, I just think of it as taking the scenic route in life. Uh, and uh, this is something that we shouldn't be afraid to do. We shouldn't try to like, you know, if it, things are not going your way, just, you know, it's okay. It's just going to take a little bit longer, but you'll get there. And the last thing I want to leave you with is, uh, you know, as an engineer, you've got to think like an artist too. Like, figure out what's your, what, what, what is your Sistine Chapel? Like, is there one thing that you build and you're like, this is, this is for my career, this is the best thing uh, that I created. This is my masterpiece, and I want, you know, I can walk away from this like not building anything else. And I feel like I haven't gone there yet, and that's what motivates me. Like, I just want to uh, get to that point. So. Um, and if you haven't uh, pain, painted your Sistine Chapel yet, then uh, you, know, you could possibly use the Uber developer platform as you can, so consider that as an option as well. Um, that's a sales pitch right there. Um, but yeah, thank you, that's, that's all I have. So, and thanks for bearing with me for the past 35, 40 minutes. <laughs> Does anybody have questions? For what? Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I would like to thank your work. Uh, it has really helped, especially in India, where I come from. Yeah. Uh, before, I used to wait for like almost three hours. Okay. At the most, it was uh, on an average one and a half hour. It was for the local transport, especially autos. But oh, wow. Uber helped with autos too. I was like, what? How, how, how is this possible? That's amazing. Uh, like, one month before I left India for my education over here, uh, Uber started the application. And I, it really helped, and it's still helping us over there. That's so awesome. I would really want to thank Uber for that. Appreciate it. And this is being recorded, so I can take it back to the <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions anybody has or comments? Uh, what do you think the impact of Uber will be on other industries, such as, for example, the uh, car rental industry. Mm -hmm. So we've traditionally not thought about car rentals as our competition, but certainly, like, you know, we're trying to reduce the need of actually renting a car. So uh, a lot of times, people just, you know, take a car from the airport to the hotel and then back, and you're not using the car; it's just sitting there, but you're paying for it on a per day basis. So uh, we want to take that cost out. So we definitely. We feel like we're making a dent in that industry, but we've not set out to actually like obliterate like car rentals or anything along those lines. But there's definitely uh, some impact there. Yes. Um, with your really fast development time, you said that was about a month. Yeah. How do you like keep track of quality? How do you make sure what your release is actually? Okay? 
Yeah, so um, we, so this in my team, we do weekly cycles, so we just uh, figure out high-level milestones for the week, and then we break, it, break them into tasks, and we go out and execute, and just uh, the one thing that we are getting better at is just estimating how much something takes, so uh, the thing that we realized was the more granular you make the task, the easier it is to estimate them. Um, so that's how we keep track of things. In terms of quality, uh, so we don't have a QA team. Um, so the engineers are actually responsible for writing tests. So most of our, uh, we follow a service-oriented architecture, and um, most of our services tend to have over 95% coverage. Uh, and like, so we shoot for it, like the, the general model that we follow there is 100% unit test coverage, and write integration tests for uh, the most frequently used paths. And uh, that's the way we kind of uh, ensure quality. Obviously, like when, it, when you have engineers writing tests, sometimes you know, bugs make it into production. Uh, you kind of have to thought about a few edge cases. Uh, but we also put in a lot of monitoring in place. So we are constantly looking at stat stats and thresholds to figure out if uh, something, if a production system is getting affected because of an error or response times or anything along those lines, uh, we get gauged and we go in and fix it immediately. What programming language do you guys use at Google in the back? Yeah, so um, we initially were just a Python house. Um, we did, uh, and that's not because you know people kind of sat down and had this council of like, which is the best language for Uber. It's just the guys who started the company knew uh, Python. And then we had a Yelp contingent that came over. Uh, and uh, they were really familiar with Python and like the infrastructure uh, around Python as well. Uh, so that's what we went with. Um, it's worked out pretty well for us um, uh, on the back end because it's, it's a really easy language to learn. Uh, so onboarding engineers, especially at the rate at which we're hiring, um, has been a lot simpler. Uh, that being said, our real-time stack is written in Node.js, so there's some JavaScript in there as well. Uh, we're starting to move towards uh, Golang uh, because it has um, like better concurrency features, so we're trying to kind of leverage that. But that's something we're experimenting with. We haven't spent a lot, a lot of time on it yet. Um, and finally, uh, we use Java for mapping logistics uh, because it's high performance. And so uh, we kind of think of the problem as, um, you know, we don't pick the programming language without figuring out the problem. So like, you want to you know, you use your programming language as a tool, not you know, uh, make decisions based on your programming language. Any other questions? Go ahead. This is a self-serving question. Yeah. <laughs> What is the uh, what are the disciplines that Uber hires? Okay, um, so it's, it's it's interesting. So if you look at Uber ETC, um, which is in Pittsburgh, uh, they're hiring electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, software engineers. Uh, no biomedical engineers yet, but <laughs> I'm not sure that's coming too. Um, but uh, yeah, traditionally on the on the West Coast, we primarily look for software engineers. Uh, we also have electrical engineers, uh, Rex for electrical engineers now, because uh, a lot of work that we're doing around safety, where uh, we actually have sensors in the car and we uh, pull in a lot of data uh, and try to process it and do uh, stuff with it. So um, electrical software is, is on the West Coast, and then electrical, mechanical, and software on the, on the East Coast. Go ahead. How would Uber Eats compare to a restaurant that has its own delivery service? In, in, in what terms? Um, would it offer a better delivery experience than the store? Uh, it, it'll be faster, right? So what, what the, the difference here is that um, we truly want to make it on demand. So the food is already in the yeah, with, with the, the person delivering the food. So you don't wait for the meal to be made and then get delivered. So essentially, if you're waiting for um, you know, pizza to be delivered, it's like 45 minutes. But say you need a sandwich with all the, uh, with the driver saying you get it within like nine or 10 minutes. Um, it's, it's, there's obviously there are challenges with that. How do you keep the food warm? Um, how do you ensure that the taste is good? You know, just like just maintaining all that. Um, but it's it's been it's still a work in progress. We're still figuring things out on that side. So it's like a food truck coming to you. Pretty much exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you guys still accepting graduate interns for this summer? <laughs> good <laughs> good, good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Where will we apply? <laughs> There's a place to apply online, but I take resumes too, so you know. Can feel free. Email to you. Yeah. 
yeah, if you email it to me at sound.uber.com and then just uh, put like UTA tag on it or something so that I know that it's, it's coming from you guys. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to forward it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so an, an average uh, entry-level interview round consists of uh, coding, architecture, problem solving, we have a bar raiser round, and a uh, cultural round with the manager. Uh, so the coding skills, we expect uh, you to know your data structures and algorithms. Um, so the, you know, there's tons of like interview books that are out there. Uh, just, I just recommend just going through and like, solving problems out of that. Um, it's pretty standard questions. We don't try to throw a curveball or anything of that sort. It just you just want to make sure you can write code. Uh, one thing we do specify though is that you don't do any whiteboard co uh, coding. You actually code with your uh, IDE, and like you have to produce runnable code at the end of your interview. Um, so if, if, if it's not running, that's kind of a red flag for us. Uh, and we also want to see your debugging skills uh, during that process. Uh, for problem solving, it uh, it tends to depend uh, because sometimes you also end up doing software design, so you might end up uh, kind of designing an elevator system and uh, just what are the classes involved, what are the, uh, what are the constraints that you want to consider in that particular problem. So you want to see how far uh, or how deep you can think. Um, and for entry level, obviously, R is a little bit lower, but at the same time, you're looking for um, you know, people who can come in and can write code, but also are good problem solvers and, think and, and can think on their feet. Uh, the architecture round tends to be pretty much something that uh, we know that you're not exposed to this stuff at you know like problems of scale in school, um, so we don't expect you to just know everything on hand. But uh, it'd be nice to just if you could go to any of these blogs like highscalability.com for example and just kind of see how bigger companies are solving problems and um, just have have an idea, right? And uh, kind of if you could mention some things where you're like, oh maybe we could solve it this way, um, that would be uh, something I would highly recommend. Uh, the bar raise around just kind of depends. It just tends to be whatever the bar raise feel, it feels like you know, that day. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but, Do you have software configuration management teams? Software configuration management. Um, in terms of uh, just configuring the infrastructure, the hosts, or what, um, what, what is software configuration? In terms of the build, checking out, checking back in, do you have processes there? Okay, that's a good question. So um, the way our development process works is essentially uh, uh, so each so we don't we don't have a monolith. It's it's broken out into services. So you're working you're at any given point in time you're working on a service. Um, so and each service has a Git repo. So you check out a branch, you make the changes, you put it up for uh, uh, as a diff which people can review and put comments on. You address the comments and then the moment you uh, land that change. It goes into production, um, so there's no sort of like you know build in, build out, or anything along those lines. So it's uh, the, the moment it gets merged to master, it's getting deployed in production. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So there was a small mention about uh, self-driving cars toward the end of the video. Yeah. Uh, like how far are you into it? Uh, I can't say. It? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so we've uh, kind of taken a very confidential approach to that, um, just because uh, it's kind of um, like pretty competitive in that space. So we try not to, like even if you look it up right now, you probably won't find any information on, um, on there. So that's one, one area that I can't speak about. He likes us, but he doesn't like us that much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's being recorded, so it goes on. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, tons of them. I mean, you know, like your standard DOS stack to like just people trying to like figure out fi figure out the loopholes of your you know of your code, right? Um, I, I mean, we have a pretty solid security team. Like we you know, constantly have patches in place and make sure like we follow the best practices. Um, but you know, you, we fall in favor of like certain things and then react to them uh, quickly. But as you're scaling, you're getting more and more. Uh, uh, you know, aware of those kind of problems and, and, and dealing with them. Um, I think the bigger question that, the bigger challenge that we've had is not a technical one, it's more of uh, just 
just um, fraud in general, like people try to game the system. Um, and because we have this really high value referral program where you know you could, you know, if you refer a driver, you get a certain amount of uh, dollars in your account. Um, so people try to like game that system. So uh, we have a pretty like top notch uh, like fraud team. I mean, they're like the actual like rocket scientists working on fraud out, which is kind of interesting. Um, and and uh, yeah, just staying on top of that. And every country has its own set of challenges. Like uh, China has its own set of challenges. India has its own set of challenges. The U.S. has its own set of challenges. So that's been more of a concern for us uh, rather than just security. Yeah. Well, let's give Sian a big round of applause. And since I know he's not leaving till the morning, he might have a few more minutes if you have yeah, a desire to come up and you. chat. But thank you very much for coming this evening, and thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much.